Hello again, everyone. It's Nikki Batgirl D'Angelo for another one of my Star Citizen Addicts Anonymous. This is episode 62. And although I have a lot to talk about from my trip last week out to California, I'm not going to dive deep into it here inside of SCIA. The reason for that is I do a weekly vlog, video blog, called State of the Game. And in the one I released just yesterday, episode 22, I did a recap of my visit. One thing I can say is the community team are wonderful people. I got to be a fly on the wall there, and let me tell you, they work their butts off, and most of it is just to make sure that they're taking care of us. From Chelsea and Alexis, otherwise known as Chilexis, to Will and James, Ben, and so many others, they are just incredible. And like I said, I'm going to leave that to state of the game. So again, if you want to see that, just click on the uh, little link up here and you'll be able to go out and see that. But come back and do that after the show. I do have a lot of information to give you. There was a lot put out last week. And although there was a monthly report, monthly reports are usually very big, very in-depth, and take a long time for me to dissect to try to pull out the things that are pertinent. Came out on Friday. Friday I was there at Cloud Imperium Games. Saturday I flew out. And I've been sick ever since. Every time I get on an airplane these days, I feel a little ill. This time I'm just falling apart. And just think about it. I was in two areas, LA and Atlanta, where there's a measles breakout. Who knows? Well, I doubt I have measles, but you know what I'm saying. Anyhow, the, uh, the report had a lot of great information in it, things about the Retaliator, the Idris, the Gladi Gladiator, um, how the FPS module is coming along, um, what they're doing with the star map. So there's a lot out there. And I think it would be a insult if you didn't go out there and read it because they're trying their best at CIG to be transparent and to deliver us the information as it's coming off of the developers' desks. And that's why sometimes you just have to be a little bit um, a little bit forgiven when things change over time. Because when things start out, like take for instance the Moby Glass where we just saw the design document maybe a week ago, there's so much in there that things are going to change so much that they didn't think they were going to be able to do but then find a way to get it done, that you got to give them a little bit of leeway in these things. So... In this monthly report, go out there, take a look at it, and read it. But I do have a little bit of an in-depth view into what was released on Friday along with that. And we're going to take this first segment and talk a little bit about the shields, gun, and skin sale. God, I had to slow down. I'm sorry. I tried to do this without sneezing and coughing. Last Friday's additions to the Voyager Direct and Pledge Store have given us the opportunity for the first time to upgrade the look of our vessels. Now they're using the Aurora as a test bed for this, but they're giving us a number of skins that we could purchase now and apply to our Auroras. This will be updated to include the rest of the vessels as time goes on, but currently there are three skins that you could add. Now it isn't a shock that if they didn't do this, we would have a bunch of ships that all look the same. And this is the first piece towards being able to build a more upgradable paint system. Here we see the first one of the paints that I'm going to talk about. And this is the pirate paint job. So if you're one of those people that bought the pirate pack with the cutlass or that just went out there and bought the pirate skin, this is a little bit of how it will look. A little bit of red and black and gray in there. And of course, the skull and crossbones. So for all you pirates out there, this one is for $5, and it's available in the Pledge store today. This next skin is made specifically for the group of people that have formed together to create Operation Pitchfork. And, of course, I don't see any OP decals on here that might change in the future. But Operation Pitchfork, folks, here you are, your own skin and created by Cloud Imperium Games for you to use. The next skin over here, of course, is the UEE skin. So for those of you that want to show off your love of the UEE, I, well, that would mean that you're not a pirate, this is a skin that you can now apply. Again, there will be more skins, as there are more skins, inside of the Pledge Store at this point. And uh, I believe that you will be able to start creating your own skins at some point in the future, although that system has not been created as of yet. 
The Voyager Direct Store also had a few additions, and these came in the form of a gun, which we'll talk about in just a second, and quite a number of shield upgrades from Seal Inc. Now, Seal Inc. has two different categories of shields that are available, ones that protect against splash damage and ones that protect against direct damage. When you're purchasing these shields, please make sure that you're purchasing a size that will fit your ship. They're sold in sizes 1 through 4, and not all ships accept all sizes. Also added to the Voyager Direct Store are the Tarantula Ballistic Cannons. Now, they pack a wallop of a punch. However, they have a slow rate of fire, and the projectiles do move at a low velocity, which means you will have to lead your targets quite a bit. Now, one thing I'll tell you about these is I think I'm going to be arming my, here you go, my F7C M Super Hornet with them. Now, one thing that you can see is that they do look like they are hovering, like there's no real attachment point at this point. And when you do fire, make sure that you're using the right pipper. The one all the way at the bottom of the triangle is actually the right one. Now, I am not using the right one here. I thought it was a square, but as soon as I start hitting, it packs a wallop of a punch. You could take down one of these kind of uh, quickly if you're able to connect with them. That's it for the additions to the two stores this week, but I will caution you. When you're looking at the Voyager Direct Store, do you understand that next week a design document will be coming out about Arena Commander credits? Now currently, if you buy things in the Voyager Direct store, they will be available in your hangar when the game goes live. It's not understood yet if that's the case for buying things with Arena Commander credits, but it does give you an opportunity to actually purchase things and try them out. And be sure of your purchase, because at the current time, you can't melt anything that is bought from Voyager Direct. Though that may change very soon. They are working on a system to allow us to melt those items to purchase new ones. We'll just have to await further details from Cloud Imperium Games on this. And with that, let's go back to the rest of the show. These are things I'm very interested in because we are going to be in an environment where almost everything is going to look the same. You're going to have the same ships flown by a lot of people. There'll be hornets everywhere. There'll be cutlasses everywhere. Um, a lot of the newbies are going to be coming in in Mustangs or Auroras. The Avengers are very, um, very popular spacecraft, as is the Freelancer. So the paint system gives us a way that right off the bat, somebody can see it and say, oh, that's Nikki Batgirl D'Angelo's ship. And that I like. And I'm not saying that they're going to right away have a way for us to personalize it with our own skins. But I do ex expect that somewhere down the line. That is something that definitely has to come in at some point. We have so many great artists that are part of this game playing it on the backer side that I think that that would be a great idea. The second piece there, that gun, oh god, that thing is tremendously big and it kicked butt. I like it, but I don't know. A little bit slow on the velocity for me. All right, we're going to take you right into the next piece, and this piece is going to be on the Shield Management System Design Doc. In addition to the sales that were announced on Friday, Cloud Imperium Games also released two documents, the monthly report and this one, the design document for Shields and Management. With the addition of this document, Cloud Imperium Games is up the ante on realism in space combat sims. In the past, shield management in space combat sims was rudimentary, just like it is in the current version of Arena Commander. You would move power to shields, you would move the shields forward, back, right, or left. There's going to be a much more upgraded power management system and shield management system in this game than any game ever before. Here you can see the shield display over on the left and the shield display of your target over in the center in a game that Chris Roberts made almost 20 years ago. Shield management in this game was pretty simple. It was part of the power management system and its own shield management system. With power management, you could move your power from weapons to shields to engines or balance them across all three. Putting it to shields mostly would mean that your shields would recharge faster. Putting it to weapons would mean that they would recharge faster. When you looked at shields individually by themselves, you'd be able to move the shields forward and aft, and I think that was all you were able to do inside of this old game. 
This system was also replicated or created on its own in other games such as X-Wing, X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter, TIE Fighter, and X-Wing Alliance, and some other very big name games from the past. In this next image, we see an early design of what will be the shield management system added to the multiplayer ships inside of Arena Commander 2.0. You can see there's quite a lot more going on here. There's different ways to add power to different pieces of the shield system, but there's also going to be a communication system between the pilot and the shield or defensive systems operator. This is taking on a brand new approach to the way that systems are handled inside of space combat sims. With this new system, in order to get more shield power, the shield operator might need to communicate with the power distribution operator to ask for more power to shields. With that, you can see how multiplayer ships is going to be much more of a team-oriented game than an individual one. I look forward to this being passed down to us, however, with all the complexity in managing shields and other systems, I wonder how that's going to be for the single-seaters in this game. Before we get into types of shields, there's also work being done on the graphics for when you hit a shield to show the dissipation over a more broad range of the shields themselves, maybe going around the whole vessel itself. Chris Roberts has made some comments about how he'd like this to go, and the design team is working on that currently. Different shield types are also being worked on. This particular version is a seal ink shield that's basically made for direct damage, while this one over here is a shield ink shield made for splash damage. Now to get more of an idea of what this is about, I'll lead you back to that design document. To talk about everything that was in the design document would be a whole show in itself. Today, I'm just trying to give you what the bullet points were of the design document. I think I've hit most of the bullet points of the design document, but I do implore you to go out and read it. It is a good read, they spent a lot of time on it, and it does show us the direction that they're headed in in shield management. Do make note, however, that just because this design document has been released does not mean that these things are set in stone. Everything is a work in progress, and things may change along the way. I look forward to next week's design document when I come here and pull out the bullet points once again. And with that, let's get back to the rest of the show. I've played a lot of these video games in the past. Anything from all the Wing Commander and Privateer series, Star Lancer and Freelancer, all the way through all the X-Wing, TIE Fighter, X-Wing versus TIE Fighter, X-Wing Alliance games, and many others. And I can tell you that they've all used this very rudimentary, very basic shield management system. When they're showing me this, and they're talking about how they're going to be implementing shields and other systems in the game, all I think about is my Falcon 4.0 manual from way back in the 90s where it was that thick and 90% of it was how to work the radar on the F-16. I'm not saying I'm scared about this. I'm saying I'm un uniquely happy and excited about this. It's going to take work. This game is not going to be for the person that wants to jump in and jump out. It's going to be for the person that really wants to jump in, learn it, and make it work. I hope they do have an easy mode, though, so we don't lose too many people that we scare off with how complex the systems can be. But I also hope they don't take away the complexity for those of us that want to have it. It's a hard balancing act, right? This game is a constant balancing act between the hardcore and the you know entry point, right? Who do we let into the game? How do we make more money? How do we continue to grow? So very excited to see this. Can't wait to see how it fleshes out. And again, this goes live inside of the, I guess it goes live inside of Arena Commander 2.0 when the multiplayer ships show up. And then later on, it will be moved over to the single player ships. All right, we uh, go through this one every week. So let's jump right into what's on Sandy's Facebook. And now it's time for What's on Sandy's Facebook. Now, I never expected this particular segment to drum up any kind of controversy, but it looks like it has. And it has because some people are being, um, well, I don't know. They have their own opinion on whether Sandy should post here exclusively or have her own thread inside of the forums. Now, I'm just going to explain it this way. Sandy's the director of marketing, and thus she's trying to find new people to come into the game. By leaving the items up here, people that like it, like myself, that have people that aren't in the game, that's going to appear inside of their Facebook. It gives another route 
for which Star Citizen can grow. Now, one thing to understand is if you don't have a Facebook account, she doesn't privatize these photos. You'll still be able to see them. You just won't be able to like or comment on them. So I can't say that you're wrong in your thinking. What I can tell you is why I know that she does this. The first image shows a stim pack or possibly some kind of way to heal yourself in the first person shooter module. In this next image over here, we see the sim pod and it is now flushed out with the artwork and is going to begin production. We should see it in our hangars soon. Here's a personal arc welder for those people that are taking up the salvage or construction mechanic. And then in this next image, of course, it's Sandy learning how to fly an arena commander. She's going through flight school so she could, well, learn how to kick butt. Here we're asked the question, which one of these Dominator missiles do we like the best? In other words, they're trying to look for the artwork that we currently like. In this next image, she points out the ballistic cannon upgrade on the Gladius. It is quite a bit bigger than the one that we currently have. I like it. And here she calls it Deeper into Nyx, and she shows off this artwork of going into the asteroid colony. And with that, let's get back to the show. I hope you like my explanation about that. I saw that there was a lot of controversy. There's threads inside of the forums. Um, one of my very, um, who I hold dear to me, uh, Jazz Arrow, had similar statements as to what I said, that you know they really think it's wrong that she only posts there. And I don't think any of you are wrong for thinking that. I'm just trying to enlighten you as to why that is. So if I go back to my statement in that piece, remember, we're trying to draw people into the game and if you market the game towards the people that are in the game, it's going to be tough to bring new people in. The way Sandy's doing this is actually using that trickle-down marketing effect. If people could get everything that they want on the website, then the website is going to be where you have to go to get everything. And that means that people will not be able to... Um, well, you won't be able to see those likes and those shares throughout the rest of the social networking. I like the fact that she uses social networking as a marketing tool. It means that when people do like something, like one of her pictures, it's seen by their friends and friends of friends. And that will bring more people into our game. All right, this next piece is a little bit cute and it has a lot to do with things that I saw when I was in Cloud Imperium games. Now, Chalexis, <laughs> I don't like calling them one person because they're two unique individuals and both wonderful. But they go through a lot. And a lot of times that they're getting tickets, they have to dissect them and they have to try to figure out what's in them. Some people out of courtesy try to write in, uh, well, let's watch this and then I'll come back and talk to you a little bit about it. So I did this short little video about how to create a ticket and what things would be great if we can do to make it easier for Chelsea, Alexis, and the rest of the support desk team. This last piece is an extra that I'm creating on my own. I spent seven and a half hours at Cloud Imperium Games last week, and most of that time was spent right here, inside the community room, watching Alexis, Chelsea, Will, and off-camera, James. They work hard every day. But Chelsea and Alexis, they plug away at tickets consistently throughout the day, sometimes not even leaving for lunch, and they have hundreds of tickets to go through a day. So I'd figure I'd give a little short description of how to create a ticket so as to get your message across clearly and concisely. So the first thing in creating a ticket, you want to give it a subject that has exactly to do with what is going on inside your account or what has happened to your account or possibly a pledge that you've made. Let's give an example here. In this piece, I'm using the concierge system, but for those of you not subscribers, you'll be sending an email in the same way. Here I'm typing in accidentally melted ship. Now I did misspell something, so I'm using spell check to go back and correct this. It just helps a little bit in the end. Then you want to select exactly what piece of the game you're talking about, whether it be an account, or any other issue that's listed here. In the body, type concisely what is happening. Don't be too long, don't be too short. If you're too short, it's gonna require follow-up emails. If you write a book of an email, it's gonna cause them to have to take a lot of time to figure out exactly what's going on. Read through your email before you send it. Read through your ticket before you submit it because it will help expedite the process and not bog them down since you can get thousands of tickets during a sale. 
The last piece is, if you are from another country other than the U.S. or Canada or speak another language other than English, type in your native language as they do have people that work in the Manchester office that speak a variety of languages. I'm talking about European languages. I did not talk to them about any of the Asian languages. But with that said, that's all I have to put out there. Chelsea and Alexis work hard. They go through hundreds of tickets a day, like I said. And they sometimes are going to make our life happy and bliss again. So let's help them help us by being clear and concise in the tickets that we create for the help desk system. I worked the help desk for IBM for years, and I can definitely empathize with them. And uh, I get tickets sometimes that I'd be reading for an hour and go, all right, what's the problem now? And they go through that. And I'm not saying that, I'm, I'm not trying to call anybody out here. What I'm trying to say is their job is incredibly difficult. And when people are contacting them, they are frantic. Oh my God, I burnt this down. Oh my God, this isn't working. I'm leaving the game. So they get a lot of these frantic calls. Well, tickets. And they just sit there, they smile, and they plug through them. What I'm trying to say is, if we could follow a few of these details that I laid out here, be clear and concise, be short but not too short, don't give them a book, and please don't put in the freaking out um, words like, I'm leaving for good, or I'm canceling my subscription. If you want them to help you, and you want to help expedite how fast the tickets get created, try to follow some of these, uh, well, some of these suggestions I laid out before you. And uh, I think that's all I want to say. And uh, I want to call out a very big thank you to my Patreon supporters. You're making it easier and easier to do this every week. It does take quite a, a lot of time to put together Star Citizen Addicts Anonymous, both this, State of the Game, and Five for Ben Lesnick. It's almost a full-time job. And the fact that you guys are supporting me and helping to alleviate some of the cost of doing this, I am in your debt. Thank you so very much. And you've humbled me by the support you've given me. Not just my Patreon supporters, but all of you that comment, like, and support the show. With that said, you all be safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon.